I'll tell you about uh, GeneRide, which is a new approach for gene therapy using adeno-associated viral vectors. Uh, we call it therapeutic gene targeting with, without nucleases. So we can modify the genome in a site-specific manner without using nucleases. I'll start with a disclosure that indeed I am the chief scientific officer of a company, Logic Bio, who is trying to develop these new applications and bring them to patients from bench to bedside. However, the data that I will show today uh, comes from academia, from the time of me being a postdoc at Stanford University at the Mark K lab. We're talking about in vivo gene therapy. So we're taking a DNA coding for a therapeutic gene and we're inserting it or encapsulating it in a viral vector, something that used to be a virus, but we have engineered it so now it only <coughs> serves as a vehicle to bring the therapeutic gene to the target uh, cells of choice and then inject it into a person with hope of curing a deficiency or a disease that that person might have. Gene therapy as a concept has had its many ups and downs. It was a great hype in the 90s, but then came a few tragedies, including the death of a patient enrolled into a clinical trial because of an adverse immune response to the viral vector that was then used. It was an adenovector. Another serious adverse event occurred in a clinical trial for X kid with a type of an immunological deficiency. These children cannot leave this bubble because they are exposed to infections. They don't have a functioning immune system. They were cured by gene therapy. They could exit the bubble and live like any one of us, but then many of them had leukemia. And that leukemia was attributed to the integration of the viral vector next to oncogenes. So that showed you yet another risk that is associated with gene therapy. Since then, and the great fall that gene therapy field has had, there was also a rise and quite a few successes, including successes in uh, retina gene therapy, kids that could not see and now have their eyesight improved, at least temporarily. In cancer therapy, now they are, we have T cells that are uh, engineered ex vivo to fight better the cancer when reintroduced into the patient with great successes in CLL and ALL, very aggressive children leukemia. And there are successes or very preliminary results, but some success with the use of genome editing in the context of gene therapy, in particular to, uh, for HIV uh, prophylaxis, one can use zinc fingers to cleave the core receptor of HIV and prevent infection by the virus. So genome editing together with gene therapy seems now like a very promising future for gene therapy. I will try to convince you today that the bright future lies in performing genome editing for, genome, for gene therapy and do so without nucleases. And we will do that specifically by using adeno-associated viral vectors. We will use AAV both as a better gene delivery tool to replace adenovectors with their immunogenicity and retro lentiviral vectors that are associated with promiscuous integration into the genome, sometime oncogenicity. We will also use AAV uh, to replace the need for gene editing tools such as CRISPR, many of you might know of, which is great for basic science, but I will show you has quite a few downsides when you wish to apply it to gene therapy. So we'll use AV for both gene delivery and genome editing. AV as a virus is a dependovirus. It cannot replicate in the human genome because it needs another virus, usually adenovirus, uh, for its replication. So AV in itself is dependo and it's also non-pathogenic. It's already safe. We use an even safer version because we don't use AV virus. We use AV vectors which are devoid of any viral genes but instead are encoding a therapeutic cassette. Usually a promoter in therapeutic gene, in our case, we don't even have a promoter, and that has additional benefits that I will discuss soon. AV is a single-stranded DNA vector, so it delivers single strand, but then inside the cell, there is intracellular processing leading to double-stranded intermediates and sometimes also to, to concatenars and to circles. We've already described the gutted design, and it, the fact that it is also an approved therapeutic, there is also uh, an approved drug for LPL deficiency in the European Union, 
and over 30 clinical trials in the US and the European Union using AAV. Uh, our hypothesis is that AAV can be used not only to deliver the transgene to be expressed in the target cells, but it can also ex uh, be used as a platform for integration by homologous recombination. The idea is that the AAV, here flanked by ITR, which are inverted terminal repeats, will encode the therapeutic gene flanked by homology arm to some desired endogenous locus. Upon delivery of the AAV, the natural mechanism of homologous recombination will uh, detect these similarity in sequences, will induce the integration of the therapeutic gene into the genome, who will then be expressed by the endogenous promoter and provide cure. Where does this hypothesis come from? Well, there is previous data showing that AAV can induce higher levels of homologous recombination than can be achieved with naked DNA, such as plasmids or any other kind of viral vector. These levels that you see here are in the range of about once every two to the 10 to the, fifth, to the five cells. That is still pretty rare and subtherapeutic, but still much higher than can be seen without AAV. We hope and have it succeeded in increasing this further. It is also interesting to note that AAV is highly specific. If you encode a selective marker that will allow cells to grow whether AAV is integrated on target or off target, and then you assess where integration has happened, in the great majority of places it integrates on target. So it's efficient and also specific in its ability to in, uh, introduce biomologous recombination. So why should we avoid nucleus? Why should we stick with AV alone and not also use CRISPR? Well, first is immunogenicity. Cas9 used in the CRISPR system is a bacterial protein that you might want to avoid from expressing in the human uh, body. There is on and off target mutations. On target mutations are problematic if you wish to correct a gene or insert a gene. Still, in most cases, the break by CRISPR will be repaired by non-homologous non end joining, leading to indels, insertions and deletions. In addition, you will have off-target mutations that are sometimes carcinogenic. The graph on the right shows you the level of indels as a marker of break efficiency on target versus off-target in some of the location. And this is by an optimized CRISPR system. So it shows you that the off-target is quite often. And the graph on the left shows you the occurrence of translocations as a result of CRISPR cleavage both on and off target, both of which, of course, might be carcinogenic. In addition, the nuclease vector, if you were to use CRISPR or talons or zinc fingers in vivo, you most probably would need to encode them, too, on a DNA vector. And that DNA vector might itself integrate, leading to stable expression of the nuclease with its associated adverse events. So we are trying to avoid the use of nucleases for all these reasons. But AV itself, even without the use of nucleases, is associated with adverse events, at least in mice. So mice that are treated as neonates tend to develop later in their life HCC, which is a pathocellular carcinoma, and HCA, a pathocellular adenoma. In this case, in the publication by Chandler et al., up to 75% of the mice had developed hepatocellular carcinoma after being injected with AAV as neonates. This is a phenomenon that is not seen after adult injections. Therefore, AAV is considered safe for uh, adult uh, and is, is used in clinical trial mostly in adults. But now when you wish to use AAV for gene therapy, in many cases one would want to use AAV early in life to avoid the complications associated with the genetic diseases. And this is an alarming data in this context. Importantly, the rate of HCC is directly correspondent to the promoter being used. If you were to use a weaker promoter or no promoter at all, then you don't see this high rate of HCC. So we wish to use not only AV for gene targeting, but to do so without using a promoter on the vector. So even in the event of off-target integration, it would not lead to cancer. How are we to use this? We are to use AAV to target a promoterless transgene to be integrated by homologous recombination 
into the albumin locus. Albumin is the most highly expressed gene in the liver, so highly expressed that more than 50% of the protein content in our plasma is just albumin. So that has, goes to, so, to show both the promoter activity and also the stability of the RNA and later of the protein in the cell and later in the plasma. So we are to hitchhike, to use many of the good attributes of albumin and confer them to the transgene. In the first example, it will be human factor 9, a coagulation factor. Efficiency will come from the use of AAV for homologous recombination and the use of the albumin promoter. And safety will come from the fact that we are not using nucleases and the fact that it's promoterless. Even off-target integration does not lead to cancer. So this is how our vector would look. This is an AV vector flanked by ITR. It would be encapsulated in AV8 variant of AV. AV8 targets the liver very well, at least in mice. The gene of interest, the GOI, will be flanked by homology arms to the albumin locus, where this is, these are exons of albumin and these are introns. And there's another moiety here about which I will explain in a moment, coding for a 2A peptide. So we will encapsulate this in an AV and uh, inject an animal. The natural process of homologous recombination will allow the integration of this uh, transgene just 5 prime of the stop codon of albumin, which will give you a fusion at the DNA level and later in the RNA level after transcription and splicing between the full albumin cDNA and the 2A gene of interest. But in the protein level, after translation, you will get two different proteins, the gene of interest and albumin, which is just tagged by 2A. So 2A peptides come from plus strand RNA viruses, such as foot and mouse disease. And they allow these tiny viruses to encode several proteins on the same uh, <coughs> reading frame. Between a single start and a single stop, you can get two or more protein. The way it is done, this is the mRNA being translated in the ribosome. The first protein is being translated when followed by translation of the 2A peptide. The, the 2A peptide causes the release of the protein already translated from the ribosome, followed by translation of the second coded protein from the same mRNA. So the mRNA stays and continues being translated. In that way, you get two different proteins without the need for a peptidize. There is no peptide bond that need to be cleaved, and yet you get two proteins from the same mRNA and even from the same reading frame. So let's start with uh, discussing our data. The first set of data uh, is with regards to hemophilia B, which is a congenital uh, blood coagulation deficiency caused by lack of activity of factor IX, which is a coagulation factor. It is a model for gene therapy because even if you restore a fraction of the normal levels of factor IX, it's already therapeutic. You can uh, relieve many of the symptoms that are associated with the disease. Indeed, there are already clinical trials with par partial success in the treatment of hemophilia B using AV vectors. You can see that the levels that they are obtaining are in the range of a few percents of the normal. These are therapeutic, but only just so. So they relieve some of the uh, associated adverse events. They uh, prevent or uh, relieve the patients of the need of such frequent uh, injections of the factor IX protein, as is usually needed for hemophilia B patients. But indeed, the field would uh, be much more satisfied if we were able to increase it by uh, quite a few more percentage, reaching the range of more than 10 and up to 20% of normal. You would also note the rise of uh, ALT and AST, which are markers of uh, liver toxicity associated with high doses of AV. These can now be uh, mitigated by the use of steroids, but they point to yet another problem with the use of high doses of AV in this setting. We were able, using GeneRide vector, as I showed you before, to reach high levels of human factor IX uh, levels in the plasma, and these were obtained first by injecting neonates. This is very important because uh, in the injection of young kids and neonates is problematic with canonical AV, 
AV that is not integrated, because AV that is not integrated will be diluted as the liver grows. The fact that we are seeing stable levels uh, within the therapeutic window after neonatal injection is already very promising. You would note that these levels even slightly increase but then stabilize after partial hepatectomy, a procedure by which we take two-thirds of the liver of the mouse, allow it to regenerate. If the AV expression was from an AV episome, non-integrating AV, you would see a reduction in expression. Here we see an intermediate rise followed by a plateau, of course, followed many months after that. In addition, we have all the proper controls, including uh, AV coding for an inverted transgene so that all off-target expression might still uh, be there, but not on-target expression because the factor 9 will be of the invert orientation with respect to the albumin locus. And with this uh, control, we don't see any expression. To my pleasant surprise, the results could be uh, replicated also when the injection were in adult mice. Uh, I did not expect this because homologous recombination is known to be at much lower rates in fully differentiated tissue such as the adult liver. And yet it is there in sufficient uh, efficiency to allow the expression of uh, therapeutic levels of factor 9. And these levels are again persistent. And the negative controls here include the invert uh, orientations I showed you before, and also the use of a plasmid instead of an AEV. So that goes to show that we need the AEV, we need the albumin locus, we might also need the 2A peptide. We need all the components in order to reach these therapeutic levels. And this is just so. So if we do a um, vector genome uh, dosing, we can see that we have not reached the plateau. We are just at the right level to have therapeutic effect. If we, had, if we were to use less, we would not be getting this therapeutic level. And this is important because we are using high doses of AV. As I showed you before, this is problematic because of immune consequences and uh, subsequent risk of ALT and AST uh, liver toxicity associated measurements. And I will show you how we can later reduce the levels of AV that we are using and still get the same therapeutic effect. Next, we wanted to show that uh, the factor 9 that we're getting uh, can uh, perform in the coagulation cascade. So we took hemophilia B mice that are deficient in factor 9. And in these mice, we injected our vector. And we can show by APTT assay, which is a floor metric way to show the coagulation cascade is active, that we can get normal coagulation times. We have normalized the coagulation times. We can also show that the factor 9 is just of the right expected size, uh, which is non-trivial. If you remember, it is fused to a 2A peptide. So this is the first indication. I will show other indications that the 2A peptide also works efficiently. We can show that expression comes uh, from the liver. After neonatal injection, we can see clusters that correspond to cells that were targeted and then expanded as the liver grew. Whereas when we inject adult mice, we can only see this single foci, isolated foci. This is qualitative and not quantitative because uh, factor 9 is a secreted protein. Uh, I will later show results from uh, Andres Muros's lab who have used GFP that are better, the, it's a better uh, transgene to quantify the uh, rate of integration uh, by histochemistry. So how, how should we quantify our success rate? First, the term success rate has many different meanings. One can uh, ask how, ma how many of the albumin alleles have been targeted by factor 9, and then how many of the albumin mRNA includes factor 9, because the factor 9 may affect the mRNA splicing or stability. And you can also ask it from the other way around about specificity. How many of the human factor 9 DNA is found in albumin? How many of the human factor 9 mRNA is fused to albumin mRNA? So how specific? is our integration and expression. So first, this is uh, a measurement of the integration success at the DNA level. It might uh, seem a trivial thing to check by real-time PCR at first because the endogenous locus here on top differs from the integrated locus. So one can envision using different real-time <coughs> PCR primer pairs and evaluate the relative abundance of these two 
uh, moieties. However, the problem is that any uh, real-time PCR primer pair that one would use to assess the abundance of the targeted locus would also amplify the episomes, the residual A, B that is there in an unintegrated form. In order to rule out this, we had to use a much more elaborated process starting by linear amplification, this is the lamb here, followed by linker ligation, specific amplification of genomic loci rather than episomes, and only then real-time assessment. And by this we have assessed the rate of integration to be in the range of 0.5% of the alleles, and if you imagine two alleles per cell, which is not always true in hepatocytes, they have uh, differential ploidy, but roughly 1% of the hepatocytes will be targeted by this measurement. However, when we measure at the RNA level, which is a little more straightforward, splicing allows us to use primers to differentiate targeted mRNA versus endogenous mRNA, the levels that we are seeing by this kind of real-time PCR comparison are in the range of 0.1% of the albumin mRNA include factor IX mRNA in it. So there's a difference between the rate in the mRNA and the rate at the DNA level. It might have to do with the noise coming from the very uh, convoluted DNA measurement, or it might come from the fact that the factor IX mRNA might reduce the stability of the albumin mRNA, causing a reduction in the signal. Next, we wanted to assess the specificity. Now asking the question from the side of the factor IX, how much of the factor IX is being expressed from the albumin locus rather than off-target integration. So primer number 13 that you see here is located outside of the homology arm on an exon that is uh, only transcribed from the endogenous albumin locus. And we can compare real-time PCR measurement of 13 and 14 versus 15 and 14. And by doing so, we can see that the signal is very similar. So most, if not all, of factor IX expression comes from the albumin uh, locus. We can then add to this both uh, northern blot analysis and uh, western blot analysis to see that we are only getting the moieties that we are expecting to see. At the mRNA level, we are only seeing the band that corresponds to the fused albumin factor IX, whereas when we use a 2A antibody for a Western, we only see the, uh, the right size that we are expecting after ribosomal skipping and not fused uh, translation of albumin and factor IX together. So that tells us that both the integration and, ex and uh, transcription are efficient, and later also the ribosomal skipping is very efficient. We next assess the toxicity, so in our system we could not detect toxicity either by ALT, which is alanine transaminases, indicative of liver toxicity, or AST, which is a more general measurement of tissue toxicity uh, body-wise, not only in the liver. In both cases, we could not see any avert toxicity. Uh, we still are missing carcinogenicity assay, and the reason is that to assess carcinogenicity, as was done by Chandler et al., which I had mentioned earlier, we need not only to inject as neonate, but to wait a year and a half and only then check for HCC. So this is a very important assay that is still missing, and we are working on it. Uh, how can we reduce the levels of the AV that we are using? We are using high doses. We wish to use, use much lower doses. So we are now using hyperactive human factor IX, which are variants uh, first found in people that have had hypercoagulation, had too much coagulation. So one such variant is the Padua mutation, and there are additional, which has higher specific activity. And by coding this into our AEV, we can use much less AEV per mouse and get cure in hemophilia B mice. So that's another uh, important step for us. So how can we uh, summarize this first part? We have no adverse effect that are associated with nucleases or promoters, simply because we use no nucleases and we use no promoters. We have stable expression, and that means that we can treat children and even neonates, which is impossible or at least very difficult with current AV uh, methods. We do not need to design or vectorize nucleases and then have them approved by the FDA because we don't use these. And having no promoter between the homology arm allows us to encode much larger transgenes, which are often a problem with AV because of its limited coding capacity. 
So these are all the advantages of our promoterless gene targeting without nucleases approach. Now that we are taking it further to the clinic, we would like to use an AV capsid variant that is good not only in the uh, mouse liver, but also in the human liver. And unfortunately, the correlation is not as good as one would hope. Some variants work well in the mouse, but when you try to translate to the clinic, they don't work so well in the human liver. But our lab, my colleague, was able to select in humanized mice, mice that uh, are repopulated with uh, human hepatocytes. Now they have a humanized liver. And in that setting, my colleague Lechik Lisowski was able to select an AV variant that uh, was able to target the human hepatocytes in this humanized mice 10 times better than can AV8 now used in the clinic. So this is the variant that we are about to use. That is about the capsid to be used in the human setting. What about the genotype? So people are not mice. Mice we use as uh, lines, so they all have the same genotype, whereas the human population varies in the genotype in the albumin locus. There are SNP differences, single nucleotide polymorphism differences, which greatly affect the rate of homologous recombination. So if we are to use it in the clinic, we have to look exactly at what haplotypes we are uh, using what haplotype the patient might have and to uh, use the right AV coding for the right homology arms in that very specific patient. Fortunately, with three different haplotypes, we cover most of the human population, so we already cloned all this into different AVs and are testing it in the humanized mouse setting, having different haplotypes coming from different donors of the human hepatocytes to that mouse. How can we go beyond hemophilia? To what other diseases uh, might this gene-ride approach uh, be applied? So hemophilia is an example of number one here, diseases where a therapeutic transgene can be secreted from a few cells and treat a uh, systemic deficiency. Another example is metabolic diseases where a few targeted cells may clear the plasma from a toxic intermediate, and there are quite a few of these including methylmalonic acidemia, propionic acidemia, Krig and Najjar, that I will describe uh, in, in, quite in a few minutes. And then there are diseases where the targeted cells have a selective advantage. If you are able to target just a few cells, these may expand, and therefore you get much more transient product and much more cured cells. Uh, these include uh, tyrosinemia, which is an FAH deficiency, epidermolosis pollosa, which is a problem in the skin, and also AAT and, and other diseases. So let's show uh, just a few additional examples. So Krieger and Asia, I'm sure many of you are familiar because of the great work done in Anders' lab, is uh, an hyperbilirubinemia because of lack of activity of an enzyme called UGT1A1. It causes intense jaundice, and uh, if untreated, it causes irreversible brain damage and death. Uh, the treatment for kids is now by phototherapy up to 12 hours a day under the blue light, and this uh, treatment becomes less and less efficient as the child grows, the skin thickens, and the ratio between body mass and uh, skin surface becomes, uh, is decreased. So the, the only real cure is liver transplant, which is not available to all patients, and even to those to which it is uh, available, it requires lifelong immunosuppressors, and of course it has side effects and risks. So we are trying to avoid this by using gene therapy, in collaboration with Anders' lab. So just briefly, the, the mice, these uh, Krig and Najjar mice, in this particular experiment, are all being treated with phototherapy for the first eight days of their life. But without the additional injection of the AV donor, this phototherapy is insufficient, and they would all die before the age of 20 days. However, if you were to inject the AV at P4 of life, these mice are now alive for 12 months and they are well, well they've been sacrificed, but they were alive for 12 months and did well uh, without any phenotypic uh, occurrence of uh, uh, symptoms of Krig and Ajar. Uh, Andres has also contributed a, a yet another great measurement of the efficiency by encoding GFP into the vectors, now allowing, uh, allowing uh, fluorescent uh, counting of the targeting and the rates that he's seeing is in the range of 0.1% of the cell, which correspond to what I saw at the RNA level. So it corresponds to at least some of the results that we had seen 
and uh, it's a great uh, way to show how the same gene wide technology can be applied to additional diseases. Yet another example is methylmalonic acidemia. Here the problem is the accumulation of acid, meth methylmalonic acid and other acids because of a problem in the uh, metabolism of uh, amino acids. Uh, different places uh, in this cascade would lead to uh, different deficiencies and uh, different accumulation of different toxic intermedia. If you were to use an AAV coding for MUT, which is the short name for methylmalonic coemutase that you see here, uh, you can allow the uh, methylmalonic uh, animals to gain weight and you can uh, reduce, uh, uh, sorry, to gain weight and reduce the uh, acidemia significantly. So we are very hopeful, hopeful that these might also lead to cure of methylmalonic acidemia. Now we'll show a very different application of the same methodology here in the context of uh, pathogenic diseases, HIV being one example of this. Uh, as you know, there is no uh, conventional vaccine to HIV. A conventional vaccine would be to give the antigen and hope that the body would uh, learn how to produce a good immune response uh, for the next encounter. But we are not very good in doing so. Our bodies are not very good in doing so for HIV because of its high rate of uh, mutation and its many special attributes. However, in the laboratory, people have been able to isolate and sometimes engineer antibodies which are very broadly neutralizing against HIV. And if our bodies just happened to encode these antibodies, then we would have been uh, not cured, but uh, prophylactic from HIV infection. So if you could use gene therapy to cause the body to express these very broadly neutralizing and potent antibodies, we would get HIV prophylaxis. And in fact, there are clinical trials ongoing with this methodology that is called vectored immunoprophylaxis. So our idea was to use gene ride, our way of integration by homologous recombination using AV for vectored immunoprophylaxis. We first did it with VRCO1, which is one variant of these broadly neutralizing antibodies. And then we've done so with several additional variants. The important thing is that we can see both high level by ELISA of expression of this antibody after being injected to mice. And also when the ELISA is done, when the plates are covered with GP120, which is the glycoprotein of HIV. So we know that the antibody being produced is not only there at high amounts, but it's also efficient in uh, um, binding to its cognate target. Then we have some preliminary results from mice that have a humanized immune system. So these mice uh, are uh, susceptible for HIV infection because they have human T cells. But if we treat these mice with our AAV, these are just two mice, so you don't see any error bars here. It's very preliminary. Uh, but it seems that we can prevent the reduction in uh, T cells that is associated with HIV infection. So in essence, it's prophylactic from HIV infection. So our long-term goal is to apply gene right not only for genetic diseases, but also for prophylaxis of pathogenic diseases where in, in the cases where natural vaccine, regular vaccine does not work well enough. Now what do we do with diseases where the targeting rates that we are seeing are not therapeutic yet? So we're seeing targeting levels, but we need more of the transient product in order to be therapeutic. So here we're using yet another trick. Uh, in order to understand this trick, I need to open a side window and explain about uh, the ty tyrosine metabolism pathway because we are about to use it. In the tyrosine metabolism pathway, which includes several enzymes in the cascade, if you have a block of the enzyme called FAH, either because of a genetic deficiency in tyrosinemia type 1 or because of the use of a drug, for example, Tsepova, then in lack of this enzyme activity, you get accumulation of a toxic intermediate that is toxic uh, cell specifically. So it wouldn't kill the body, it would kill the very specific cell where you have the accumulation of this toxic intermediate. If you are to block the cascade higher up, for example, by using the drug NTBC, which blocks the, enzymes, the enzyme HPD, then you will not get to this place of the toxic intermediate and the cell will survive. You can keep tyrosinemic mice on NTBC and they survive well. They don't have tyrosinemia. 
Alternatively, you can use an shRNA to block HPD, and again, you don't see accumulation of the toxic intermediate. And we are about to use this system in order to confer a selective advantage to the targeted cells. How do we do that? We will incorporate, in addition to the regular gene ride vector as I had shown you before, we now incorporate an additional moiety, a microRNA, in the tyrosine pathway to block HPD. First, I will show you how this works in tyrosinemic mice here in the left. These mice lack FAH activity because of a genetic deficiency. But if you now target cells that encode the shRNA, these cells will repopulate the liver of mice taken off NTBC. So mice taken off NTBC, all their cells in the liver will die because of the accumulation of the toxic intermediate, except for the cells that now encode the shRNA. So because the cells that now encode the shRNA are also the cells that encode the transgene, you can see logs increase in the expression of the therapeutic transgene. So that's great, but it is not yet clinically relevant because most uh, the genetic deficiencies don't include an FAH deficiency. But we can induce a similar effect by using a drug, Sepoba, to specifically kill all the uh, hepatocytes that are not targeted with the shRNA. And in that manner, we were able to, in a collaboration with the Grompy lab at OHSU, to get a 20-fold increase in the expression of our therapeutic gene. For example, in the context of Craig and Ajar, the expression of UGT1A1, if we were able to get a similar increase, we would get not only to therapeutic levels of bilirubin, but to normal levels, normal low levels of bilirubin. So we are very hopeful about the use of this method. Of course, first the toxicity of Sepoba have to be interrogated. At least in the mouse model, we were able to see no toxic effects, neither ALT nor RST nor any other measurement of toxicity. So let us summarize. Gene right is a potentially safe alternative for in vivo gene therapy. It uses AV, which is a relatively safe vector, and it does so without promoters and without nucleases. It was shown to be effective in the amelioration of very diverse medical conditions, including genetic diseases and pathogenic diseases. And in those diseases where gene ride alone is insufficient to get therapeutic levels, you can do it in conjunction with in vivo expansion and increase the rate of targeted cells and hence the rate of transgene product. By that I conclude and I would like to thank first my Stanford University lab and my mentor Mark Kay and our many collaborating including the ICGB and the Muro lab. And thank you.